Hello and welcome to the No Shame Podcast. I'm John Groders. Today's guest is someone I'd like to mentor me in just about every area of life. Mark Young is the kind of guy who just plain has put it all together. He's a pleasure to know, a joy to work with, and someone bold enough to speak up with no shame. Welcome to the No Shame Podcast. This is John Groders. My guest today is Mark Young. And uh, Mark, I would welcome you to my studios, but we're in your studio. Hey, whatever works. It does work. Um, this is the first time we've ever done the No Shame Podcast in another podcast studio, but it's, a, it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you for talking to me. I've got a lot of things I would like to talk to you about, and I think you're going to enjoy this, this interview. But we are in, well, tell me where we are. You tell me. Well, we're, out, we're right outside of Detroit. And this is the, it's the offices where we have a couple of our companies, but this is also where we produce several podcasts. And the podcast we produce here is Blunt Force Truth, which is a pretty big political podcast, which we never intended for it to be. Uh, I co-host that with Chuck Woolery. And then I do another show, which is called Living Beyond 120, which is about be living to 120 years old, which is right out of Genesis 6.3. My spirit shall not strive with man forever, but his days shall be numbered 120 years. Moses is going to go 120. We're going to go 120. Yep. And then the, uh, the third show I do, and there's actually a fourth one, we let that off. But the hmm. third show I do is called The American Checklist. Hmm. And that hmm. is, uh, I do that with a co-host of Dan Sullivan. And Dan's one of the preeminent leaders in the world in business thought. Hmm. Hmm. And just an amazing, amazing guy. Well, Mark, it's, really, it's great to be with you today, and this whole thing of the podcast, I, I was with you a few months ago when, when Podcast One, I believe, picked up. Yes. How's that gone so far? We are now with Podcast One, so that's, you know, that's different. That puts us with uh, Adam Carolla and Laura Ingram and puts us in some pretty good company. This is Blunt Force Truth Podcast. Blunt Force yeah. Truth, right. So if you get picked up by Podcast One, how does that affect your listenership and viewership? Um. Well, the first thing it does is brings advertising revenue into your show. But the second thing is they also do promotions uh, and cross promote between different shows. So they have a lot of other shows where they'll, you know, promote each, promote their other shows. And of course they feature us on the front of the uh, podcast one app. Mm -hmm. So if you're listening to this, if you've caught, uh, if you find your way to the no shame podcast as a listener, you already understand how podcasts work. If not, you're not hearing us right now. But Mark, you're one of, I, one of my pioneers in the world of podcasting. And I wanted to explore, because we're here to talk about the intersection of faith and culture. Culture is changing all the time. It changes rapidly. And it takes a special set of eyeglasses to be able to, to notice those seismic changes as they come. The podcast as an art form, as a communication form, is how old? Can you kind of back me up? Podcast has been around for a long time. And podcasting, so it got the name, as most people probably know, from the iPod. Because you could download the, you know, an audio and you could listen to it on an iPod. The concept of podcasting almost died. And it uh, was pretty kind of, it was, it was something that was for kind of nerdy people. And then something happened. And this is what happens in most of the big technological breakthroughs. And it's a convergence of technologies. So as an example, Facebook wouldn't be who they are if it wasn't for band, bandwidth and mobile devices, and mobile devices with good cameras that came together that made it that. What happened with podcasting was smartphones, so all of a sudden I can download the shows, bandwidth, because it became easy to download the shows, and the other part of that convergence was automobiles having Bluetooth. So now all of a sudden, I can listen to a podcast in my car, I can get out of the car, it'll stop wherever I left off, I get back in the car and it picks back up. So that's what made podcast explode. So what's really happened with podcasting is podcasting has now become talk radio on demand. Exactly. And it also has another big feature, which you know, and that is we're not controlled by the government. We're not controlled by the FCC. We're not controlled by Google. We're not controlled by Facebook or Twitter. So it creates an environment where you can tell your story. 
you can speak the truth and no one can stop you from doing it. I walked into your office today. I said, oh, you're reading some important papers. <laughs> and you laughed and you told me what was on those papers. That's another side uh, quality of podcast. What were you looking at today? Well, it was a list. Uh, it was a list, just the current list off of Facebook that Patrick had put together, uh, showing all the hate and vitriol <laughs> for Chuck Woolery huh. on that particular list. And I have my own list to hate. He gets his list to hate. I get my list to hate. Uh, for some reason, he gets more name calling. I get more death threats. I'm not quite <laughs> sure why that is. Maybe America still loves him at some level. <laughs> So they don't want to kill him as badly. Well, it's sort of fascinating. There's a number of uh, things that that suggests. But when you say that the podcast is not regulated by the government, it's not regulated by Facebook, not regulated by Google, it is really very constitutional in a way, isn't it? How would, it, how would that fit in with an American you know, principle? Well, certainly podcast plays into First Amendment where you can say whatever you want to say and it's hard for anybody to, to edit you or shut you down. They do try, by the way, many people on the left do try to shut down podcasts. The way they do it is to try to boycott their advertisers, threaten the advertisers, do whatever the case is, but you can't stop the message no matter what you do. Um, it is a way of leveling the playing field. When you look at the media today, and again, just giving my own opinion, but you look at the media today, 90% of the media is heavily tilted to the left. CNN, MSNBC, NBC, CBS, you know, uh, New York Times, Washington, Post. we can go through the list. They're all tilted to the left. The conservatives have what? They have Fox News, which is our friends, and, and we love Fox News and love, have many great friends over there, but they're even moving to the middle. You have a couple of other smaller networks, you know, like uh, OAN or, you know, uh, you know I'm thinking of um, Newsmax. You have some talk radio like Rush and you have podcasting. Right. So, I mean, we have, we have to use whatever technology we can to be able to tell our story because they are controlling so much of, they're controlling so much of the media platform. And this is why you're, this is why you're seeing so much effort on the side of the left. I mean, you look at uh, Frederica Wilson. So you know who that is? Congresswoman Frederica Wilson. Always running around with the cowboy hat on and all the rhinestones and everything. She came out last week and said that the government should be allowed to prosecute and imprison anyone who makes fun of a member of Congress. While wearing her rhinestone and purple hat. Yeah. Well, that was my comment. My comment was stop dressing like a cowboy with rhinestones and maybe somebody will stop making fun of you. But, but reality, how un-American is that? Fundamentally un-American. Right. We, we built a country based on the ability to talk about our elected officials. We were based on the whole premise that we were a country of laws, not a country of men, and that we had the right to disagree, we had the right to challenge our, our leaders, and they want to end that. I was in Korea shooting a film two weeks ago, or three weeks ago now, and uh, we were doing an, a film about North Korea. We were not filming in North Korea, but you want to know the opposite of that constitutional right is the North Korean culture. Mm -hmm. you, um, I learned this while I was over there. You may not say the word God in North Korea. That is an act of treason against the supreme ruler you can't even imagine the possibility of saying a cr critical comment against the supreme ruler so frederica is moving us in my opinion in that direction well john when we when we look at when we look at the entire slate of who's running for the presidency on the democratic side everyone on the slate is now all in on socialism everyone is all in on on a borderless country they're all in on uh, health care for illegal aliens. They're all in on destroying the entire economy for the Green New Deal. Here's, here's, the, here's the long and the short of it. It's socialism. Socialism and Christianity can't coexist. And wherever you see socialism or communism, 
one of the first things you have to do is you have to destroy faith. Because you can't have a faith in God and have a faith in the supreme leader or faith in the government. Government needs to become the God. Uh, you look at Canada. Now, we think of Canada being very much like us, but Canada has become very socialist. Canada now is having a major problem keeping any of the churches open. And you spend time in Europe. Churches in Europe are just places where you go tour to see architecture. They're not religious facilities anymore. They're historical facilities. Faith has been crushed in Europe. It's being crushed in Canada. That's what socialism does, and that's why these people want to do this. This, this, The second thing you have to get rid of, by the way, to make socialism work, you have to get rid of faith. Second thing you have to do is you have to get rid of the middle class. You can't have a middle class. Why? Because you can't have people that aren't dependent on the government. So in a socialist environment, you have everyone who's dependent on the government, and then at the top, those people who control what the other people get to have. So it's happened every time it's been tried that I've, I've been spent time in many Eastern Bloc countries in Estonia and Russia, just recently spent a lot of time in Romania. It was until 1989 when Nikolai Ceausescu was finally overthrown in Romania. 89 might seem like a long time ago to some people. I remember it. And uh, many of the crew members that I was working with in Romania were telling me stories when we weren't running the camera. Oh, yeah, I was right here. And one of the small stories is they said you would wait, you had to wait seven years to get an automobile. And then when you did get one, it was a piece of absolute junk in the same right. car, car everybody got. So what, they prom- what socialism promises you is you know, free stuff, free college education, free health care, free automobile, free cell phones. If they ever deliver on any of those things, the quality of those is inevitably putrid. You wait forever to see a doctor. You know, if you get a, uh, you know, if, how is college education going to actually be free? Are the professors going to work for free? Are the campuses going to run? It, it's, a, it's hard to resist the promise of free stuff. And so even countries where people have known better, like Romania, while we were there filming, they had an election and the socialist side won. And everybody that I was working with was up in arms. They were protesting hundreds of thousands of people in the street. And I remember saying to Ian, how did, how did they win? You guys know better. They said they go out and they promise free stuff. And that gets the votes. Free stuff is very alluring. Now you hear Bernie Sanders always talking about we have to wipe up all the student debt. We have to have free college. What you never see Bernie Sanders tell people is, where do you have free government college in this country? It's called the GI Bill. You can join the service right now. You can attend college while you're working for the, the military. You're being paid to sit in a college classroom. Hmm. You can graduate college and you can pick up $35,000 more in, in GI benefits hmm. that you can use 10 years from when you're out of the military for college. Hmm. So why do we need a free college program when we have a free college program? Hmm. Well, these are anti-military people. Plus, it doesn't, it's not sexy. If I tell you, well, you get a free college, you go in the military, then it's like, well, that's not free. I have to do something. Right. Right. No, 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 no. You can sit home, do whatever you want. We'll just give you free money. Hmm. It's, it's all about that. I mean, give Bernie Sanders, all of them, with their you know, minimum wage issue. People need to have a livable wage. Minimum wage jobs weren't made to raise families. Starter jobs. Right. It's where kids go, they're working, you know, part-time out of high school, you're working way through college, and you're making, and nobody's making minimum wage today. Where do you know anybody that's actually making minimum wage? But these aren't meant to raise families. So instead of getting people to take responsibility for themselves and say, I'm not going to start a family until I start a career, I'm just going to go ahead and start having babies and work at McDonald's my entire life, and I'm going to blame everybody else because they don't have enough money. Well, that's, that's not how the world works. That's not how capitalism works. It's, it's not how Jesus looked at the world. I mean, people, you know, if you always hear a lot of people talk about, what would Jesus do if he was here today? I don't think he'd be a communist. And I don't think he'd be a socialist. Is it unfair when people say, just if you want to see what happens, look at Venezuela. Look at Cuba. Look at North Korea. Is that an unfair accusation? The 
the left will always say, so the right will say Venezuela is an example, right? You will see the left come in and say, that's a horrible example. That's not a, that's not a correct example. That, and they will say that was socialism done wrong. Actually, Venezuela was socialism done exactly the way socialism is supposed to be done. So one of the things people, people get confused on what socialism is. So you'll see the, the left will say, well, look what happens. You know, look at Sweden. You know, they have socialism. No, they actually don't. They don't have a minimum wage. They don't have a lot of the attributes of, of socialism. What they have is they have a lot of free services. And they have decided as a small country to have very high taxes. Socialism specifically is when government takes control of the means of production. So you could technically have socialized medicine and not be a social, socialist country. Or you could have college and not be a socialist country. Those are very socialist things, but they're not socialism. Socialism is when the, the government takes over the means of production. But here's the thing, John. We have all this conversation about socialist, anti-socialist. Socialism is not going to take root in America. Let's take a look at all the people who are, are that are running for president and espousing socialism. They're all capitalists. You, you look at AOC running around with $5,000 designer suits and her iPhone, drinking her Starbucks coffee, wearing $700 Jimmy Choo shoes. Bernie Sanders. Well, socialism has never been for the leadership, right? It's, it's never been for those at the top. But none of them are socialists. No. Bernie Sanders with three homes flying on private jets. If Bernie Sanders was a legit socialist, he would sell the three homes. He would give away the millions he has in the bank or give it to the government. And he would live off of a minimum salary in some small, you know, adequate residence. None of them are socialists. The second thing is we have something in America called the Electoral College. At the moment. And they're not going to get rid of it. Right. They're going to try to work around. They're trying to do a 36-state pack. They're not going to get it. And the only way they're going to get rid of the Electoral College is with a constitutional amendment. Now, most people don't understand how the Electoral College works. So the way the left tries to portray it to people is – Shouldn't the popular vote decide who's going to be president? The founding fathers, in their infinite wisdom, knew that if the popular vote became the means of electing the president, then only the biggest states would pick the president. So they created the Electoral College based on how many congressional seats and how many Senate seats. Congressional seats are very broken up by you know, population, two Senate seats to every state. So what we have in this country, you keep hearing people say democracy, democracy, democracy. America is not a democracy. America is a constitutionally limited republic with 50 democracies in it. And what you have in a presidential election is 50 democratic elections. And then each one of those elections pledge their votes within the constitutional republic for who they want for president. This is how you take a Montana and make a Montana not get crushed by a California because we have two Senate seats, same as you do. So if we got rid of the Electoral College, California, New York, Chicago, and maybe Texas would be the deciding factors in every presidential race from now on. You would, never, you would only have Democratic candidates, but they're never going to get rid of it. You know, you remember the Federalist Papers, and there was a time when this was a massive debate, whether we should be one united nation of states, or there was a very legitimate proposal to break it into four separate nations with separate, mm -hmm. you know, like in Europe. And, you know, these brilliant founders, Hamilton and Jay and Madison, they spent many, many words discussing this. If we were only going to elect national representation based on the votes in California and New York, how long would the union survive? Right. It wouldn't. It would not survive. And I'll give you an example of when we did screw it up. We screwed it up in America in 1913 with something called the 17th Amendment. So the 17th Amendment was when we changed the Senate to become a popular vote. Now, most people are not aware of this. 
pre-1913, senators were chosen by the state legislature. They were ambassadors. So the state legislature would pick two, two elder statesmen to go to Washington, be their members of Senate, and to be the voice of the state legislature. Hmm. And if they didn't do what the state legislature said, the governor could recall them and replace them. Hmm. I did not know that. This is the way the founding fathers designed huh. it. Then under that whole Woodrow Wilson era, which yeah. is when progressivism really started to take hold in America, they passed the 17th Amendment. Now think about how familiar this sounds. The promotion, the advertising for it, to get it approved by the people, was shouldn't you have the right to pick your own senator instead of the legislature? Shouldn't the popular vote be what determines who's going to be a senator? Sounds just like the argument to get rid of the Electoral College. Yep. Franklin wrote in his writings that if we ever lose the Senate, if the Senate ever, in fact, what he said is if the Senate ever falls to popular vote, the Senate will cease to represent the needs of their communities and their cities, and their loyalty will be to party and Washington. Now, how's that for looking into the future? That's prolific. <laughs> It's uncanny when you, you just mentioned Franklin. And when I was recently just reviewing those Federalist Papers, the same thing, the way they were able to anticipate what would happen if was prescient beyond any understanding I ever had. They saw what would happen, and they were right. I got to tell you, I, these, were, these, were, these were regular men. So the first thing we have to look at is when we look at the Founding Fathers, they were the one percenters of their time. Mm. Most people don't realize George Washington was the wealthiest president in the history of America until uh, President Trump. Hmm. Most people don't know that. Mm -hmm. If you adjust it for today's dollars. Hmm. These were the one percenters. These were the super wealthy people. So first off, one of the reasons why the left hates wealth, wealth that is not theirs, wealth that is not in their circle, is because wealth equals freedom. People who have a lot of power have a lot of ability to move about. The government can't control them as well. And these are the people who can cause changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you looked at the founding fathers in today's world, mm -hmm. the left today would try to call them uh, Nazis and terrorists. Right. That's what they would be called. But regardless, they were still men. They were still human. They, they had frailties. Right. They had obsessions. They had quirks. They had, some of them had slaves. They were imperfect men. But the union of these men, the gathering of these men at that time, I believe was divinely inspired. And I think when we look at the ability to see around corners and to see hundreds of years out, mm. I believe that that was, those, those, that was divine wisdom. Mm that was given to them. Huh. It, was, it was a special time with some special people that had, that had God's providence all over them. Well, Mark, you and I have been discussing an idea, and I'd like to talk about that for a minute, about that very thing. And uh, we'll just talk about it on this podcast. If anyone's listening, tell us what you think of this idea. But I have been uh, working on pulling together a slate of Great stories, great stories that will be told in feature film form about the providence that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. the principles, which were important, and then the people, the stories of the people that made America unique in the history of the world. This time when they came together and said, this is a biblical concept. Man is sinful by nature. Pride is at the core of who we are. The heart is deceptive above all things. It doesn't matter if you're a tyrant you're sinful. If you're a mob, you're sinful. The, the faults and the problems that have happened are not so much um, the inevitable, inevitable result of any particular government. They're the inevitable result of the human condition. So America has faults in our past. We have had slavery. We have broken treaties. We have taken you know, abuse. But that's not the fault of the system, in my opinion. That's the essence of man as a fallen being. And the founders said, then let's, let's divide up responsibility. Let's, let's limit power. Let's have tri-camera. Let's have checks and balances. Let's have government by the people for the people. 
not because we're going to create a perfect system, but because we're going to mitigate the flaws that are going to be inevitable as people grab power. And, and let me comment on that for a second. When you look at America, we're, we're a flawed nation that has met, it made many flaws. Slavery was, was a horrible thing to have, or interning Japanese Americans during World War II, or Native American treatment. I mean, there's all these things that have happened. But what other country in history have you ever seen that they identify the flaw and they make changes to correct it? America is constantly trying to say, hey, this is, this is not right. Let's make it better. But in the eyes of the, of the socialists, in the eyes of the left, America is irredeemable. It can, never, it can never be any good. I mean, you look at, you know, like arguments, you know, for we have to pay reparations. Reparations. Now, we're going to pay reparations to individuals who have family from six generations ago who may have been in slavery, and I, who am a first-generation American, need to pay for that because somehow I caused that. I mean, that's a ridiculous comment. And by the way, the Democrats know they will never pay reparations. It's, it's just pandering for votes. They know they're never going to pay it. If we have a chance to, this conversation is inspiring to me, because when we look at things that inherently seem true to me and seem true to the founding fathers, seem true even in history as we look at the record, um, just by upholding the stories, the thoughts, again, the principles, the people, and then the hand of providence. It's a word we don't use so much anymore, providence. Tell me what mm -hmm. that means. I mean, what do I think the word providence yeah. means? I mean, to me, providence is, is literally the, the gift, the wisdom of God that has been put upon a, a, a nation. Uh, and I think we can, we can lose it. Mm-hmm. You can lose providence. I think you could, you could lose God's protection or God's wisdom or God's providence over you. Hmm. I think there's many, many stories of the hand of providence in the history of this country. And, and I'm sure in many countries around the world, but this country was an interesting uh, experiment. Some called it the greatest church growth movement in the history of the world. New church. Still is. People came here to have a chance to worship freely. When the Founding Fathers came, the most quoted, the most researched, the most substantive book of all, I mean, more than John Locke, more than he was the Bible. And many of them would say, this republic will work, is the morals and teachings of the Bible are at the fabric of the heart of the people. And apart from that, you can't make enough laws. You can't anticipate every flaw. Well, as Ben Franklin said, you know, we're giving you a republic if you can keep it. Yeah. What other country, you've traveled the world. What other country do you know whose most sacred monuments are cemeteries of their own citizens who died in the fight for freedom for other people? Hmm. You look at, at, in America, we've died for the freedom of Europe. We died to save France. We died to save England. We have died to... to Save so many countries that we had literally no dog in that fight. If you think about it, our people sacrificed their lives for the freedom of others. What other country has done that or done it to the extent that this country has done it? Well, only a country that would be motivated by biblical principles such as love your neighbor as yourself, so, such as uh, greater love hath no person that, that, than that they would lay their life down for their friends. These are not natural uh, philosophies. These are not philosophies that come out of evolution. They don't come out of nature. They come only from God, providence, as we would call it, 600,000 in the Civil War. I mean, I don't know of any other country that's done that. I don't know of any other monuments that are of that, that nature. No, I mean, all you need to do is just go take a stroll through, through Arlington yeah, and, and look and see, okay, all these people in Arlington, where did they die? Yeah. And you'll be overwhelmed with how many of them died defending other nations. Other places. 
Mark, in addition to uh, the podcasts that you do, in addition to the business that you run here, marketing company, broadcasting, um, there's something else that you've been involved with for a number of years. And it's, it's actually, it's at the foundation of this conversation too. And it's an organization called World Mission. Can you tell me about them? Yeah, World Mission's a great organization. World Mission was founded, you know, by uh, Paul Land. And um, did you get a chance to know Paul? Did you ever? Not really, no. Didn't get any spare time. Paul was an amazing guy. And he was, um, the left would refer to him as one of those evil one percenters. Mm -hmm. Guy who built a lot of wealth and who generously Mm -hmm. gave that money away to so many different causes and so many different groups. Mm. And the purpose behind World Mission, it's what we would refer to as a great commission ministry. And the real purpose is, to describe this, folks, is across the country, especially across the, the northern tier, what we refer to as the 1040 window across northern Africa, are millions and millions of people who are unreached, These are people who have never heard the name of Jesus. And when we look at the Great Commission, we know that our job is to go out and spread the word to the four corners of the earth. And and the Great Commission is not the great suggestion. It's actually actually a commandment. I think a lot of people think of the Ten Commandments as being the only commandments. And, you know, that's the ten, but there are others. And the Great Commission is really a commandment to to go out into all the world. Yeah. If you want to follow biblical teachings, you would come to the conclusion that the return of Christ isn't going to happen until the Great Commission is fulfilled. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And the ends of the earth. So our job at World Mission is to go to those ends of the earth. So we've recorded the New Testament. in We have recordings of it in about 6,000 different languages and dialects. And you have to keep in mind, folks, that when you're in Northern Africa, you could have a dialect of a language and 30 miles over is a different dialect or, or language. So there's, these languages literally can change by distances that we would think of as cities here in the U.S. And we take all these and we put these messages onto a solar paneled uh, MP3 player called the treasure that we have built for us. And we distribute these through the 1040 window. And as you know, John, we we do a lot of humanitarian things. We draw water, we, you know, provide medical care, uh, animal care. So there's a lot of things that we do, but the key is getting this word into people because these are people that are oral learners. Most of them are illiterate. Uh, So even if you could find a Bible written in the Pocot language, which probably isn't very likely, they wouldn't be able to read it anyways. And also, as you know, we work with a lot of other ministries. So the, the kind of premise is you have people over there that are doing ministry and they're exposing people to the word of God. But what happens after they leave? How do these people grow in the word of God? How can you grow in the word of God if you can't read the word of God and if you can't hear the word of God, you don't have a Bible. So that's really what we're doing. So in a lot of cases, people like Charles Stanley at In Touch Ministry, they might be doing evangelistic work. We'll come in behind them. We've spent a lot of time working with Franklin Graham's group at Samaritan's Purse. But it's really about trying to spread the word to people. And uh, you are now a group of the, a member of the organization, which has been awesome to have you there. And you're probably starting to see we're, we're reaching a lot of people. Um, but the need is enormous. And here's a number that I will give you that is staggering. And first off, I'm going to give you two numbers. One, if we think of a heartbeat, so we just think of the bump, 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 bump. Every time that happens, one person dies in this world who was never, ever exposed to the name Jesus. They passed into eternity and never had an opportunity. The second number I'm going to give you is that there is less money spent every year on reaching the unreached people in the world. So less money is spent fulfilling the Great Commission every year than Americans 
spend on Halloween costumes for their pets. Not for themselves, for their pets. We spend more money putting double ears on our dogs <laughs> than we do trying to fulfill God's commandment of the Great Commission. Hmm. To me, that is staggering. Hmm. I'm speaking with Mark Young. This is the No Shame Podcast, and uh, we like to talk about the intersection of faith and culture on this podcast. Mark is one of the most amazing people I've come across as a businessman, as a thinker, as a you know, as sort of a philosopher, and as a, a Christian involved in world mission. I think these things all meld together. I want to leave you with a story, Mark. Tomorrow, my daughter, Jordan, is taking off. Jordan and her husband, Zach, um, brought in refugee foster kids into their home, and, mm -hmm. and they brought in three girls. Uh, two were from Eritrea. One was from um, Congo. The, the young woman from Congo fled one night five years ago as her village was being raided and shot up and burned by Islamic terrorists, basically. And, and by the way, this is something we experience at World Mission all the time. All the time. Our workers get taken hostage. All Our churches get machine gunned up by yeah. the Boko Haram. This is not an, an unusual occurrence. No, you won't see it on the CBS Evening News, but it is happening our world, the persecution, the martyrdom. So this young woman, and uh, she fled. Never again saw her mother, her father, her sisters, or her brother. Ended up herself making it to a, basically a refugee camp. Mm -hmm. And by a number of circumstances, was ultimately aligned and brought to America, and she met my daughter, Jordan. Oh, that's amazing. Zach. A year ago, almost a year ago, but as far as this young woman know, her family were all dead. They got a phone call. It was her mother. And they all fell on the floor and were crying, and just, her mother had survived along with her sister. They don't know about the father and the brother. And... Um, so Jordan and this young girl tomorrow are getting on an airplane to fly to Uganda where they're going to be reunited. And uh, it's, not a, it's not a trip without some risks. There's an awful lot no, of kidnapping. Absolutely. And uh, these are three young women that will be traveling alone and together into, this, into the heart of South Central Africa. But what's a beautiful thing is Jordan doesn't have even the, the finances. You talk about the money. And she put out this story on her Facebook post that within an hour enough people sent enough money to cover this trip and make some donations. She'll be speaking. She'll be teaching. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Now, how many years has it been since she has seen her, her mother? Oh, four or five. I mean, she was in the refugee camps for a couple of years before she came here. She's been here three or three or three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So this will be an interesting trip. They're leaving tomorrow. My prayers are with them. Uh, not just safety. I mean, as a father, right. I want her to be safe, but the kingdom of God is about more than safety. It's about expanding the kingdom of God. And that's why she's going. She be safer staying home. But to go there, to make this reunion, to, to share the love of Christ, that's a beautiful thing. And it's at the heart of what we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes. Well, daughter, it sounds like you raised your daughter right. She's raising me, actually, yeah. <laughs> you know, I wish, I wish every young person in America would go spend a week or two weeks in a third world country. Um, because they have no idea what poverty looks like. Yeah. When you look at poverty in America, we measure poverty in America by, you know, how many cable channels do I have? And, you know, and can I afford to buy concert tickets and do I get the latest iPhone? Yeah. And yes, we have homeless in America, but we have homeless in America for a different reason. But when we look at our, our poorest people, our poorest people would consider would be considered to be wealthy. If they don't have to walk nine miles to get to the well, which we don't have to do very often in the U.S. We do dig wells with World Mission, and I've been in mm -hmm. countries, Ghana, other places where you literally have a many mile each oh, direction, absolutely walk every day, twice a day, to bring water back. Absolutely, water. and just you know, uh, my daughter. I brought my daughter from Guatemala, and. There was a pastor there named Pastor Corichichi. And my friend and I would visit Pastor Corichichi while we were there, there a couple times. And he ran a feeding program for children. And 
it was a, like the first day we were there, we went and he had 78 kids in here. And we went and we went to an American restaurant. We bought 78 hamburgers, 78 <laughs> milkshakes, 78 orders of French fries. We brought them it's all like back. the Clemson football team. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, look, you know, I was I was doing this before the president was. So he got his idea from you. Exactly. We brought all these there, and we're watching these kids, and they're taking these basically what looks like Whoppers from Burger King, and they're cutting a piece off, and they're eating it, and they're carefully wrapping the rest of it up. Bringing it home. And, I, and so, I, yeah, and I said to Pastor Corey Cheech, I'm like, well, why are they eating their food? Why are they taking it home? Well, they, they want to take it home because hmm. no one in their family has ever had an American hamburger, <laughs> and they've never seen one. And they want to take it home so they can share it and show it to the rest of their family. Because you're talking about a country where day labor at the time when I was there was $2 a day. Yeah. But going to a McDonald's in Guatemala City was still the same price as going here. Right. So these are people who would never even be able to go in one of those restaurants in their own city. Yeah. Because of what they were making. But... What I was going to say about kids, we went there and we asked the pastor what he wanted us to bring for the kids. And he said, well, toothbrushes, toothpaste, hairbrushes, combs, and fruit cups. Okay? So my friend and I take these big duffel bags full of these things. And I have a videotape of this. And these beautiful children are lined up waiting for my buddy and I to give them a toothbrush and a comb and a fruit cup and some toothpaste and the smiles on their faces and the excitement amongst them would not have been equaled if we'd have been handing out free X, Xbox games to kids in America. And I went to his church last, uh, later that day and he has a church and every wall of the church is built out of a different material. So it's wood on this wall and block on this wall and corrugated metal on this wall. And church is seven days a week. Hmm. Praise and worship hmm. is like 45 minutes. Hmm. And these people are singing and praising. And I'm watching people with tears running down their eyes with their hands in the air, praising God. Hmm. And Pastor Kurochichi is saying, they had a bowl of rice today. Hmm. That's why they're so grateful. They're thanking God because they ate today. Mm. We don't know. We don't know what it's like to do without. And we don't know what it's like to have that level of gratitude. The last thing I'll say is I'm going to talk about at World Mission, we plant churches. Mm -hmm. And it is not uncommon for people like the Boko Haram to come along and machine gun up our churches. Yep, burn them to the ground. Kill and, and people will say, a lot of people haven't heard of the Boko Haram, and they'll say, well, who are they? And what I do is I say, well, imagine there was an Islamic terrorism convention going on. And ISIS and Al-Qaeda got together, and they, they said, see those guys in the corner? That's the Boko Haram. Stay away from them. They're nuts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, <laughs> that's kind of how bad they are. Nigeria and places like that. You think of we get up in the morning on a Sunday morning and we say, Jesus, I don't know if I want to go to church today. It's kind of rainy out. It's cold. You know, I don't know if I'm get the park close and it's, you know, the parking's really bad. These are people who get up in the morning on a Sunday morning and they ask themselves, is this the day I will meet Jesus? Right. Not, am I going to church to experience yeah. Jesus? Will I meet him today? Because, by my very walking into that little structure, that, that tent, that hut, whatever is it being held in, there's a reasonable expectation I might die. Yeah. Christian persecution is massive all over America, but we haven't experienced it at this level yet. No. We have not experienced, are you willing to die for your belief? Right. Are you willing to lose children because of your belief? Are you willing to sit in prison because of your belief? That's what these people are doing over there. That's what's happening. We have people, you've met many of the people who work for World Mission who are, who are our pastors in the field. These people have been in prison. They've had their wives taken from them. They've had their children murdered because of their refusal to deny Christ. 
we don't we don't know that we don't have that kind of understanding our faith has never been tested like that those are people with no shame those are people the new testament describes as the world is not worthy of them and those are people who in the book of revelation are the first to graduate the martyrs are the first uh we have a faith that says this is the step this is the step one but there is going to be a step two and this is the world we live in, and that's why we talk about things like America, because if we see our uh, chance for uh, freedom and freedom of faith and, uh, to, to be eroded, it's worth fighting for. It's worth preventing. These are not happy circumstances when Boko Haram comes to your village. At the same time, as members of the kingdom of God, um, we're one body with them. They are our family. Those churches being gunned down, those widows and those children, they're our brothers, our sisters, our mothers, our fathers. And uh, in that way, the kingdom of God is a unique singularity. I was having lunch one day with uh, one of our people from Africa. And Greg Kelly's there. I'm there. There's a couple of other people there. And he says to me, he has this beautiful, warm smile, just this, this countenance hmm. about him that is loving. Hmm. And he says to me, we are so grateful for the work you do and the things you do. We could never do our work at that. And I'm like, and I look at the guy and I'm like, you need to stop hmm. Hmm. because I do nothing. Hmm. I can write a check. Hmm. You had your children taken from you. Yeah. You sat in prison hmm. because you didn't want to deny Christ. I'm nothing in faith compared to what you've done. Hmm. Don't ever think you need to thank me. I'm thanking you. Hmm. It is powerful. When we come across people of that kind of character, that kind of faith, that kind of love, they find joy in the midst of poverty. They find hope in the midst of tragedy. They, they, they sit under the authority of the word of God and they devour it uh, with passion and with joy. It's a privilege to serve on World Mission. It's a privilege to have this conversation with you. Thank you again for opening your studios today for this broadcast. And Patrick, thank you for sitting over there pushing buttons and whatever you're doing. <laughs> um, you've been listening to the No Shame Podcast and our guest has been Mark Young. Thank you for listening. Thank you. No Shame is a weekly podcast where John Groders discusses life at the intersection of faith and culture. Subscribe today by going to johngroders.com, select the podcast tab, and hit subscribe. Listen whenever you have time, but don't miss any of these life-giving conversations.